Good afternoon, everyone. This is Patrick from The Poison Pen. And uh, it is a real treat to have uh, Charles Todd with us today. And that is the mother-son duo, Caroline and uh, Charles. And um, for those of you watching on Facebook, I'm gonna be largely in the background, but if you wanna send in your questions, uh, I'll be monitoring the Facebook feed and we'll pop up about a half hour, 45 minutes in uh, and ask them some of your questions. So uh, Barbara, I'm gonna hand it over to you. I'm going to hold up a glass and toast the two of you for the 23rd <laughs> Inspector Ian Rutledge detective story. It's, it's just amazing. It's just amazing. Lot. Um, and I have to say that I did, I did some research to, for this book, which I'm going to talk about, but Charles was kind enough to hold up a copy. Um, and I've asked him to do that because not only is it a gorgeous cover, but this is my reminder to say that Carolyn and Todd, we have autographed copies coming from Charles Todd, um, probably shipping Monday to the Poison Pen. And if you want to support them and thank you for doing this program. We ask you to order one, it'd be terrific. So guys, um, I was trying, I've been to the Marcher country. I have been to Shrewsbury, Shropshire, Wales, all these good parts that you're writing about. And I've been under the Telford Aqueduct, but I've never actually thought about how it worked. So I went and did some research and to make this story work, Charles, you probably are the best one of us to describe it. It's a narrow boat canal. 128 yes. <laughs> feet above the floor of the riverbed and the valley and the construction it of it is in, uh, It was originally built in 1817. One of the main things that changed the economics of England was the ability to bring crops that used to have to be drawn down terrible roads to get from the farms into the cities and metropolitan areas and get uh, ore and things like that transported into the towns. The road system, as you can well imagine, was a bumpy, rickety road system, a lot of it using ancient uh, Roman roads. And they came up with the brilliant idea of building canals to run along where they already had water, but to set up a system where long, narrow boats could fit in this small canal with room on the sides, just enough room for a horse to pull the narrow boat along the canal. And the transformation was incredible. One horse pulling a narrow boat could carry four times what you could get on a horse and cart going down the back roads. And it was reliable and it was something that they could schedule. They knew when something would arrive. The problem was when they came across gorges like in Telford, where all of a sudden to go down like that and come back up was gravitationally impossible. And they sort of stole from the Roman aqueduct system and built these long narrow bridges running across the gorge. And as the one in Telford does, it's high above I'm serious, we actually took a narrow boat. <clears throat> Ours was motor operated, but uh, we took a narrow boat across that gorge. And I'm telling you, there's not much room on either side. And you're looking down a very long way to that rushing river. And uh, it, was, it was a marvel to behold. And not only did the narrow boats create a great economic driver. It also created a culture of people who traveled up and down these uh, <clears throat> canals and got to know each other. And, and it was a really close-knit community 
of transient people traveling from point to point. Well, I could say yeah, thank you. Well, I was going to say the scary thing when you're sitting in this six foot wide boat and there's six foot of macadam beside you where the horse used to walk and you can just lean over and look down into the river below. And if you have vertigo, it's not the place for you. <laughs> it's really scary. <laughs> well, there are two things I would add. One, um, the pottery industry was one of the big yes. pushers for the canals because pottery couldn't survive being bumped over roads. And so Josiah Wedgwood and some of the other great people up in Staffordshire were big uh, canal boosters. But the real question for me, well, there are two, um, about the canal in this book. Um, first of all, did the canal, you know, how did they get the water across the canal? And the answer is that there was a big copper, like a bathtub that that was the water carrier. So basically- That was the six foot. It, yeah, the aqueduct, the aqueduct had attached to it this gigantic long bathtub that allowed a six foot boat to go down it. But the horse had to walk across. Now, the modern, the modern picture of the Telford Aqueduct, there is a fence. There is a serious barrier between the horse path and the crash you know, over the side to the River Dee. But in reading your book, I was able to determine that the unlucky horse, which was blindfolded, walked along this narrow path. And in fact, there was no barrier there. And that's how your body, in fact, goes crashing down into the River Dee and starts this book off. And I thought to myself, it must have been really terrifying to be up there with no fencing whatsoever. When we were there, um, there was a pipe about an um, inch and a half, two inch pipe that ran from one side of the gorge to the other uh, on, on the outer side of this macadam. Right. And every four feet, they had a vertical pipe. And I don't know that that would have stopped you if you had lost your balance. No, not really. No, I don't think so. But you know, the way they now have fencing over freeway bridges and so forth to prevent yeah. people from either casting themselves off into the traffic or throwing things, you know, I, that's what they now have up. I just looked at a very recent picture of it. But I, I, and I bring this up because readers who are going to read your book need to visualize what this thing involved. Yeah, and and there were, yeah. there's no wire to catch you. On oh, this one, right. you took your risks as you went across the boat, and people could walk back if they wanted to along the horse trace. But the problem was, you know, you <laughs> you were taking your life in your hands. I mean, I I can see why people might have fallen or were pushed uh, to their deaths into the River D below. Well, we've had a record number of people falling into or being pushed into the Grand Canyon. Uh, oh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, now it has been. But in any case, your book starts out with a wonderful scene you know, with this young boy um, decides to take his fishing pole and head out to see what he could do, his very first shot um, in the River D. And unluckily for him, what he finds is not a great fish, but in fact, a body. And the only way the body could have gotten there eventually it works out, as if it had fallen off the, the horse path, the macadam um, of the canal high above. And um, I thought, I think that visually that's a really great opening scene. Um, and for, okay. those, for those of you who can't imagine it, just Google Telford Aqueduct and look at the photos and discard the guardrail, which didn't exist, and you will get an idea of what we're talking about. So. You two always go and research on site. So I gather that you, in fact, did go to Telford and rode the narrow boat right over the top of it. OK. Yes. And they and gave yes. us the opportunity to walk back if we wanted to. And I think one or two brave souls tried it. But uh, I wanted to get home to write the story. I didn't want to take any chances. So did you did you know that you wanted to have a body thrown off the aqueduct before you went, or did you go up there and decide that you couldn't resist the idea of a body pitched off the aqueduct? It, it was irresistible, let me tell you. 
we weren't sure exactly where the body was going to be found. And once we we visited um, the the aqueduct, we knew without a doubt that this was, and and it's a it's a very isolated location, so you could drop a body over and unless he fell in a place where people had farms, uh, it would be several days before he was found. If he landed in the river, uh, he could very easily wash all the way out to sea because the river continues past um, Chester uh, out into the, the, uh, the North Atlantic. And it's just, you know, a, it's just amazing. Well, it was unlucky for the killer that, in fact, the body snagged up in the River Dee for the kid to find it with his fishing <laughs> pole and didn't wash away. Lord. So um, that's a beautiful country. I absolutely love that country. Was that, Charles, is this the first time you had been to the Welsh Marches and the Shrewsbury? Uh, we had been to Shrewsbury. I had not been into Northern Wales before. Uh, and all in that northern area up towards the castle that we went to visit and everything else. You know, strangely, I found Northern Wales to remind me a little bit of the Lake District. Mm -hmm. It does. I love it. I've spent a lot of time there. One of the most beautiful gardens in England is called Bodnet. And, um, and it's, it's just, I was there when the, um, I'm trying to remember what the drippy stuff, the purple drippy stuff is. Um, oh, the golden rain tree? Yeah, it's just extraordinary. But there's some great castles, Conwy and so forth, and you can go all the way out yeah. to the Straits of Manai. Um, you know, is I think it's Northern Wales is absolutely gorgeous. Um, is there a little train that goes up Mount Snowden? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there is a little train. I've driven up Mount Snowden, which is even more exciting, <laughs> but nonetheless. Um, but but you know, one of the things that I love about Shrewsbury, Alice Peters was. I'd like to think a very dear friend. We corresponded a lot, but I went to visit her often. Um, oh, wonderful. And I've always loved the idea of Shrewsbury because the way it's situated on the east, there is what they call the English Bridge because the river makes a loop around Shrewsbury. So you have the English Bridge on the east, and then you have the Welsh Bridge on the west. And um, I've always thought that was a perfect um, symbol of you know the, that border country which then runs down you know through Ludlow and so forth. I love Ludlow it's one of my favorite places. Yeah and and there's but there's a wonderful British author whose name I want to call him Phil is it Rickard? Rick, gosh I'll have to look up his last name. He wrote a series set in the Welsh marsh country and it had a slightly supernatural element to it and, and you know there's a lot of fog and you know they're it's just a wonderful country, but it's kind of ghostly. And those who, in the fog is ghostly. There yeah. may be some people watching who don't know what you mean by March country. All right, why don't you explain it? <laughs> well, that area on the border between England and Wales was the scene of many, many feudal battles and territory swapped hands uh, fairly frequently, and that is what the British word marches, M-A-R-C-H-E-S, refers to that area of uh, feudal warfare and uh, the, the constant, during that period, there, there wasn't a lot of peace and tranquility, so to speak. And uh, people had to be careful where they went and where they wound up because uh, just going out by yourself was not a very safe proposition. Now, pacifying, pacifying Wales was a really big thing. When Edward I was not hammering the Scots, he was actually <laughs> hammering the Welsh. And that's where these castles, you may remember that Prince Charles had a whole ceremony in Carnarvon Castle. And yes. you know, there's a whole chain of, um, of castles there. Conway is my personal favorite. Uh, Patrick, Harlick was mine. That which is one? Harlick was mine. Harlick, yeah, I like Harlick too. It was Harlick. part of the settlement with the Welsh was when the original king of England uh, 
arranged the marriage with the daughter of the Welsh king. And that made it where whoever is the crown prince of England is always the Prince of Wales first. Right, there were a number of chieftains. Patrick just reminded me the author I was trying to think of is Phil Rickman. And I think Phil Rickman's novels are absolutely wonderful. I don't know that they're available in the US in print, but you can probably find them on Kindle or something. And they are really magical about this country. Alice Peters books were absolutely magical, Brother Cadville and uh, A Morbid Taste for Bones, which yeah. started off a, you know, sort of a gigantic historical mystery rush. Um, they, they're all in Shrewsbury. Uh, Brother Cadville, returning from the Crusades, um, was um, the abbey at Shrewsbury was his home abbey. And because of that strategic location, there was a constant, a lot of stuff happening where she was able to write 20 fabulous mysteries all about it. Oh, yeah. But anyway, where he was, it's torn down now, it has been for, for some time. We stood in the parking lot across from the abbey church where the daughter was and where the, the um, infirmary stood, the, the cloisters. I, it just, you would have to stand there and imagine Cadfell striding down one of the corridors. There's not a lot of it left, but it was very near the English Bridge, you know, the Abbey and the English Bridge yes. were there together. But anyway, I bring it up because Shrewsbury plays an important part in, um, in A Fatal Lie. But why doesn't one of you do an elevator pitch for the book? There's no reason. You should talk about your own book, not me talking <laughs> about your book. Well, <clears throat> this is a, a book that intrigued us because it started out as a very simple mystery the idea that an unidentified man is fished out of a river. But it, as Rutledge looks into his life and traces him to his family, all of a sudden the case explodes into something shocking. Um, for us, this was very interesting to write because as we followed Rutledge through the, the identification process, we could begin to see how the family was um, uh, structured and how the people around them um, counted in the storyline. I mean, this is a wonderful thing about being on the ground and being able to, to bring the mystery together. But the, the main thing in this story is that it's a tangle of lies. Everybody lies. They have secrets that they're willing to keep at any price. And Rutledge has to find out why a very good, a very decent man had to die and which lie out of all those he is told over the course of the investigation, which lie was the fatal one? Which lie sent this man to his death? And that was a, a, a challenge and, and a very exciting to do as we sort of unpeeled the onion and found out what was at the core of this whole um, mystery that he was having to, to straighten out before he could identify the murderer. Now, Ron was just set up there. You, Sorry, I was just going to say, Ron was just set up there partly because his evil boss back in Scotland Yard, who's always, you know, really pissed at him, um, thinks that he can exile him to North Wales. Um, so <laughs> it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't appear to be a very interesting case and it's in a poor location you know he has to drive to get there or he does drive to get there and it's a good thing he has his motor car because he really needs it um are you you know charles are you using this conflict between rutledge and his superior um to to get him into investigations outside of london i mean it's a great it's a great device the main thing is we didn't want to write about London. There are so many detectives who were, were um, uh, posted in London. We wanted to talk about the villages because these villages have so much to, to tell you. Um, there are places, just like Miss Marple said, where murder can happen and can be covered up and even the police can't figure it out. It's the history of a village, the 
people who live there, the the atmosphere in the village all contribute to what happens. So that's more interesting to us than fighting gangs in, in London where you can where you sort of know how it's going to end here. When you're you're dealing with the psychology of people, anything can happen. And that's the 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 great thing about um, not plotting. We just sort of follow the story and see to see where it leads us. One of the things that we enjoy looking at is oh. what are the circumstances to that lead an ordinary De generally decent person to get into a situation for, where they feel that the only way they can resolve the situation is by killing another human being. And Rutledge has an uncanny, uncanny ability to recognize the one thing that makes a difference. He knows what it's like to kill. Now that he's served his time in war, he knows the scar that leaves on your soul. It's kind of like if you ever got in trouble as a kid and you <laughs> say to yourself or someone says to you, well, just act normal. All of a sudden you don't realize, you can't figure out what normal is because everything is abnormal. And the links that people will go to, to keep their secret, once they've told the lie, a lot of times there's the lie to cover the lie, to cover the lie, to situations where all of a sudden you're recognizing the fact that in order to keep concealing this one thing, you've got to take other further actions to protect that lie and all the time not getting caught. And it's that psychological suspense between Rutledge, the policeman who's trying to solve the crime and the guilty party who is trying as hard as they can not to get caught. That's the dynamic that we love to to discuss uh, to explore. Well, that that's really well said because you're right. Once the lie starts, there's a snowball effect that you know it just starts rolling downhill and leads to people can get from A to B, but rarely seem to be able to get from B to C or C to D, as we're certainly sure. playing out in public right now in this country. Um, and I do find it fascinating that it goes. But, but my question was, uh, let's come back to it. Um, and I agree with Carolyn that going out in the villages and so forth is really fascinating. But he is based in London, I'm, although Scotland Yard has a remit, obviously, all over uh, yeah. the United Kingdom. Is the conflict with his superior a way of making sure that he gets sent off to interesting locations? Uh, mm -hmm. as, you know, it's kind of a what let me ask Charles that uh, because really it's a it's a form of punishment but it turns out not to be at least for purposes of the book well in a couple of it varies the original uh superintendent was Bowles right and yes Bowles did not like him at all and was doing everything he possibly could to see Rutledge fail and that continues because a lot of times when you have a situation where a boss recognizes a certain resource and ability they're caught in the rock and the hard place of they want to use that talent and skill for their own purposes but they don't want to be challenged by that resource. Rutledge poses both situations. He's very good at what he does, but because he's very good at what he does and so dogged about it, uh, he doesn't really get upset if it ruffles some feathers in the process. And so his bosses, want to keep him around, but kind of 
out of sight, out of mind, so to speak. There was also this problem that Scotland Yard itself was changing a lot of the um, uh, hierarchy and the men on uh, uh, and the, uh, the offices were, they came up from the ranks, much as, for example, uh, Pitt did in, in Anne Perry's wonderful series. Um, they don't like this idea of college educated men coming in and taking over the the running of the yard, and yet it's their, the college educated men who have a great deal of knowledge to deal with things, whereas the, the old guard likes to think that they have the experience. So it's sort of experience versus um, uh, background, and I, I think this has been interesting to deal with. Something happens in the, I guess the book we just turned in, um, that sort of intrigues us. We'll see what, what that does with the dynamics between Rutledge and his superiors. Well, the other advantage, you know, to, to the yard for Rutledge or for Rutledge himself is that he's single. He doesn't have a family. He doesn't have a wife and kids. And so they could dispatch him, you know, to the far ends of the United Kingdom without um, a lot of falderall. And he can go because he just has like a to-go bag, right? He practically has a right. permanent to-go bag and you know, off he goes. But this, this It's case... funny because that is actually based on a little bit on my reality because when I was a uh, operations analyst for re the regional offices, uh, I had a bag that I kept packed at all times because the phone would ring and off I went. And, uh, you know, you had travel size toiletries and everything so that you just <laughs> right. could be at the airport in 45 minutes and ready to go and not know necessarily how long you were going to be gone. Uh, this is precisely why we started I, riding together. I think in many ways, though, <clears throat> I think Rutledge enjoys what he does. Uh, I think in many ways, Rutledge likes getting out and away and sort of working on his own. He's willing to, to work with the other local inspectors and constables and that kind of thing, but uh, he's not really one for London office politics. Well, I think that's very true. And I brought up the question of his car, motor car, as you call it. Um, and him driving up there. This is a book, it seemed to me, in which the investigation takes longer than usual. I mean, it goes mm -hmm. on for quite a while. And he's driving all over. I mean, you know, it, it requires, if he hadn't taken his motor car, I don't know how he ever would have brought this case off because he needs it. I mean, he, he's in Telford, he's in Shrewsbury, he's wandering about the countryside, doing, not wandering, purposely driving around the countryside. Um, and so there's a there's a different pace to this investigation because it, you know, it's strung out. Um, it's very hard to get any kind of answers. People are scattered all over, so he has to keep going places in order to talk to them. It's very different than a murder like in metropolitan London or something. This is interesting because when I was at Bloody Scotland some years ago, the convention there, um, I believe his name was Tom Woods spoke and he in 1956 mind you he solved the first case where it involved multiple cities and initiated the idea that one constabulary had to pass on information to the others because until then whatever happened on your patch was your problem and you didn't compare it with anything you didn't work with a village 20 miles down the road. And because of a van that was used in that series of um, killings, uh, they began to realize that people were more mobile and therefore the, the cases were going to expand over quite a lot of territory sometimes, not always, but sometimes. And so Rutledge is sort of the 
the forerunner of this. He he understands that what happens in Shrewsbury may have something to do with what happened in Chester, rather than saying this is a Shrewsbury um, uh, case and only for that area. He branches out and and. Um, if you're ever interested in the Hollywood murders in Scotland, um, that's a fascinating look at, at how Scotland Yard and the local police began to expand. But nonetheless, he has to check in with the local, you know, the local yeah. constabulary wherever he goes. He can't just show up and muscle them out. And that brings conflict into it, too, because the locals don't really like this guy coming in from London and telling them what to do. But because they were so localized, the larger part of the story, which I don't want to go into for spoilers because it really would be, but this case is bigger than the guy that falls off the Telford Aqueduct. Um, and, and that went on for a long time because it, everything was so localized. I thought you, you really illustrated that extremely well. Well, thank you. And am I wrong in thinking this was to go into conventions and seeing how crime varied and was um, dealt with over a vast number of years and what changed. For example, even in Rutledge's day, they had fingerprints. The problem was if you had a fingerprint in London, there was no way to find out that the same man had committed a crime in Liverpool or Edinburgh because you couldn't, you had hundreds of thousands of fingerprints after a while, but nowhere, no way to come to, to deal with them until fairly recent times. Yeah, well, the there wasn't a first, database. The yeah. very first use of fingerprint in a criminal trial was actually in Argentina in the 1870s, but that was a situation where they had the suspect, they were convinced that he had done it, and they were able right then and there to get his fingerprints, match his fingerprints to the fingerprints found on a specific item. Yeah. And that was very easy. Whereas to just go around and say, oh, there's a fingerprint here. I wonder whose it is. <laughs> uh, it, it wasn't until the, the markings, the, the markers, you know, what they call like a seven point match or a four point match, et cetera. It was really the computers that that made all of that system possible to be able to now go on like the NCIC, the national database, that kind of thing, and find people's fingerprints where they might have given their fingerprint for a liquor license or as a stock trader or as a school teacher. Uh, nowadays, you could find those fingerprints on the national database and yeah. do a great deal. Whereas when you're just looking through a bunch of what looks like going into the old library card catalog and going manually one by one by one, looking at the fingerprint, you know, for all you know, two cards stuck together and you missed it and you didn't even know and they, you know, thousands of different cards that they would look through. There was no real system of organizing the fingerprints in such a way that they could start with a large sample and narrow it down as they went. And so, it, it still goes back to the one thing that we have always loved and admired and why we tend to gravitate to the golden age of mystery is that sense of the detective through his wits, his knowledge and his understanding of human interaction that ultimately is what is able to solve the crime. So Rutledge is covering a lot of territory, rushing around in his motor car, um, often it would have been sort of embarrassing if he'd been picked up. Actually, was he stopped for speeding at one point? Do I remember a scene like that? Or am I just imagining that? Probably imagining it. Well, anyway, here he is. I'm sorry, I missed what you said. I said, was, was Rutledge at one point stopped for speeding and all this while he was 
roaring all around this territory? No. He was driving. Oh, he was. Somebody stops him for another reason. Uh, yeah. Well, I knew he was stopped. He I just couldn't remember why. Because <clears throat> that car is kind of hard to miss. And when he's going down a back road in the middle of nowhere, it does draw attention to a certain degree. It's and, a wonderful car to ride in. Oh, oh it, it's a real pleasure to ride it. It's amazing how smooth that ride is, considering how old that car is. So I have two questions. One, does he get any kind of expenses from the yard, or is he paying for all this petrol out of his own pocket? He gets expenses. He does. OK. That's and part of the report. Second question is that Hamish tends to show up when Rutledge is um, driving. And so since he's driving a lot, does Hamish figure, I know the answer, but I'm asking it for you to answer. Does Hamish show up in this book um, more or less than he might? Mostly Hamish shows up when Rutledge is under stress. Um, Hamish can only know what Rutledge knows. He can't feed him the answer to a murder mystery, but the main thing is that um, when they're together, Hamish has more access to his mind uh, than he might in a, a busy marketplace or um, when he's questioning people. Sometimes Hamish does speak up, <clears throat> but he has, he has full access to Rutledge when he's driving. Well, yeah, he's kind of like a backseat driver, or you know. Well, he, he actually does sit. He sits directly behind Rutledge right. in the back seat. That's why Rutledge never looks, in, as he he's said before, he doesn't look for him in the rearview mirror. And in in this book, uh, somebody sits in Hamish's seat, and Rutledge is a little miffed. Yes. Indeed he is. So is the fact that this investigation took longer than usual, you've been very good about advancing Rutledge in very small increments of time from the end of the war. It's only been like, what, three years for 23 books? Yeah. This so is early spring of 1921, and Tessa Wells began in May of 1919. Some of his cases, you know, wind up quite quickly, but this one obviously is a bigger chunk of time. So are you going to write a more compressed book to come afterwards so you don't move him too far along? Uh, this one, the one we just turned in is more compressed. I wondered, you know, because he sort of need to compensate for... Much of it, the odd thing is that much of it depends on what the crime is and what it entails. Um, <clears throat> in this particular case, because of the number of lies that people were telling and the secrets that they were hiding, um, Rutledge has to chase them all down. He can't assume at any one point that they're correct or a lie. He has to make certain of this and it keeps him busy. But um, this was this was a fun book to write. I mean, you know, and getting to go back over old territory we hadn't i had i had been to that part of wales twice and charles was there for the first time but it was just like avebury we both had been to avebury before and this last trip we saw something there that we thought we might use in a book and that was um the book just before this rutledge did you read about today did you read about the decision um or the the archaeologist uh theory about Stonehenge. It was in, I think, the Times. I saw that. I, I it's don't really know. fascinating. Well, they think now that it was migrated, the stones were all migrated over to the Salisbury Plain from Wales. That basically these people decided to move and they took the stones, their ancestors, with them. And they have found a ghost hole in this one site in Wales that exactly fits the dimensions of one of the stones over in Salisbury. And of course the blue stones always, we always knew they came from Wales. Yes. But I was completely fascinated because you know, there are all these theories about, you know, no, it's really an ancient computer and it was really there, you know, to, <laughs> and, and now it turns out that it might've been more like Easter Island, you know, where they put up these stones to, you know, and honor their ancestors. And then when they moved, they took them with, which really takes kind of the mystique out of it, but. Well, it's going to be a BBC program, and I, I wish I could be there to see what the what the conclusions are and how they did this. It's still fascinating. I, I 
I understand about where the stones came from and their purpose, but it's the arranging of the stones once they got them there that allowed them to line everything up with the uh, solstice. Right, but the sighted whales did the same thing. Yes. Um, yeah. Because now that they have figured it out, and and the dimensions of the circle were the same, and you know the lineup with the solstice was the same, right. and the whole bit. So and the and they think of it being a computer of sorts yeah. is still there. Yeah, yeah, no, uh, it is, and you know they apparently hauled it on sledges, you know, sort of like the way they built the pyramids, you know, with hundreds of people <laughs> pulling something along. Anyway, I just I thought it was really fascinating. It was. I can't wait to hear more. Well, I you know a lot of manpower it took. That's what amazes me, you know, because they <laughs> found places where the people who were working at Stonehenge were living, but they could tell that they weren't people indigenous to that area. And once the structure was set, those people moved away. They didn't. It wasn't like you find a St. Paul's Cathedral in the middle of, of London because it was a metropolitan area that had that place built. It was, they went out in the middle of nowhere and brought people from all over the place uh, to put that together. And it, just, the, just the mere communication that it took. Yeah. Yeah, over yeah. what was it the past amazing. distance. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it's they amazing. didn't have cars, right? No motor no. cars. <laughs> no, it was really so. Um, one of the other thoughts that I had when I was in one of the interesting things about reading a fatal lie is that Rutledge is so far away from London, um, and he's you know not in great favor with his superiors. So Sergeant Gibson um, is his anchor back in London, and he has to consult. Gibson a few times, but he also has a problem in that he's gone so long. Um, who's looking after his house? And, you know, he has a passing thought about Francis. Is that his name? Her name? Um, and his sister. His sister. Yeah, um, right. His sister. Um, but there's also a woman in his life, very vaguely, whose name is obviously something different. I guess. Oh, Melinda. Melinda yeah. Crawford. Right. Okay, so anyway, there's um, there's a lot going on. I like the fact that he is so far from, there's a real stretch to his general net uh, because he is so far away and he is gone for so long. It's a very different kind of a, of a case. And, and really the body in the, in, off the aqueduct and in the river is the instigating incident, but um, it leads to much broader inquiries. So I think it's fascinating. Let's invite Patrick to come and join us and see if we have questions and comments from the audience. He's going to reappear from the black hole there. <laughs> there Hi, Patrick. I'm here. I'm here. It's a fascinating conversation. Um, uh, to kind of digress a little bit, has either of you seen the the dig? That yes. New well, I watch. We watched the dig yes. just recently. A fantastic film. It really is. Listen, Ralph Fiennes is amazing. Yeah. I think in the role. Yeah. But Oh, yes. I looked it all up afterward, and I was fascinated to see that she was the one who had all the money. I thought she was a woman who had married a wealthy landowner, and that's how it went. But if you look at it, she was the one with the money, which is why she was able to give away the Sutton Hoo treasury to the British Museum and not even think about it, aside from the fact she was dying. I thought it was really well done. Yes. And I've seen it. I mean, I'm sure you guys have been to see it um, in the library. Or British music. The main thing is, is um, it's not too far from where I spend a lot of time when I'm in England. All right. So, Patrick, did you enjoy yeah. it? I gather you watched I it. it was, I thought it was terrific. Yeah, and I yeah. thought that uh, Carrie Mulligan, I thought did a great job. She did. Um, but um, you know, considering how much the the role the the motor car plays in this book. Do you see this in some way as a, a transitional period where, you know, where Rutledge, he's, he is in the process of, of becoming a modern day uh, in detective? Is there, is there a point, uh, what point do you think the old era and the new modern era, is there a point of demarcation somewhere here? I think very much the, 
this is a foreshadowing because it was in the Hollywood murder case um, in Scotland was in, I think, 1956, um, something like that. So it takes a long time for forensics to catch up with, with uh, crime. And Rutledge is sort of feeling his way through some things that he has learned from experience and is using his own knowledge about things to, to um, sort of foreshadow what's going to happen in the whole um, uh, crime fighting business, you know, the, uh, what the yard does, what the Met does, what the individual, I mean, up until 1956, it, it was almost the same as in Rutledge's time. Well, and the, I think you're also asking about the conflict between the old guard, so to speak, and these new whippersnappers with the uh, college educations coming up. Is it a uh, class? Is it a class distinction? It, it is. In some uh, ways, yes. Yeah. <clears throat> if you go back to the original founding of, of the Scotland Yard and the Metropolitan Police, and who those original officers were and how they picked out the detectives and everything. I'm not going into that long diatribe, but they were, as a rule, sort of more of a working class type of person who uh, achieved a certain amount of rank within the organization. Obviously, at the top of the organization, you had uh more of the gentleman class but below that was all predominantly a a working class uh type of situation that's one of the reasons why rutledge's father didn't want him going into the police business because it was considered sort of uh step down in class and once again the one good thing that we have is, is it's only the spring of 1921, the early spring of 1921. So a lot of time has not passed. There's been 23 novels out of it, but... Uh, Mainly to follow what Rutledge is doing with, with Hamish. That's why we have set them so close together because we were curious to see how he was going to cope and whether Hamish would win or he would win. Um, but back to the policeman, um, in the early days, the policeman had to go to the servant's entrance. Nowadays, he goes to the front door. And so this gives you some idea of the difference in social class that um, he was not acceptable in the front door. Well, he has to be able to, uh, you know, go go into different strata of society and and really get into the dark streets and yeah. investigate where maybe he wouldn't have been able to if he was one of the, one of the toffs as it were you know well, be... you know patrick that's part of the the point of the of the charlotte and thomas pitt series and perry's very long running series which carolyn has referenced earlier is that pitt was considered to be the the lower the working class guy um and charlotte who was more gently born had a, a window and thanks to her sister who married into the aristocracy, they could they could find out information from the upper classes that would have been very difficult for Pitt to do in a and really war structure. Hmm? Rutledge's war experience dealing with the men in the trenches, I don't care if you went to Eton or just ordinary grammar school in your little town, you were all there in the mud together. And as a commanding officer, Rutledge had to be able to relate to the privates and the corporals that did not come from the same class that he did. And it shows when he's out uh, investigating a case, he can relate to the different classes in a way that, that people will accept him and tell him things 
that they might not ordinarily share with somebody from a completely different class. Good point. Um, uh, so I have a, a really good question from Lynn, who says, um, have you considered having Rutledge go to another country, uh, maybe following a case, not permanently, just as a consultant or otherwise? The problem with that is he has no jurisdiction. But <clears throat> he, in this book that we've just turned in, um, there's a slight bit of that. I won't go into details, but um, basically, he would be there as a courtesy, not as a, an investigator. He could advise, but he couldn't carry out the investigations. Uh, Rumble did this once. He went to Africa, and it was very interesting to see how that was um, uh, worked out so that R Rumble could do his usual thing, but he had a different relationship with the people there that he had had with the people in uh, Whitehall. I'm not Whitehall, um, Whitechapel. So it, his venue was London and the, the people he, he knew who were the small time criminals. It just wasn't as good. So the colonies, the British colonies, uh, the jurisdiction, if he was to go to one of them, he wouldn't really have any any power. He would be there more as a courtesy. Yeah. Gotcha. Right. He could be part of it, but he could not lead the the um, uh, investigation. Sure, he could be on yeah. holiday and and be called in to consult or something just because he happened to be there. Gotcha. <laughs> uh, yeah. But that was yeah, it's a bit of a stretch because because of Rutledge's relationship with his supervisors and him being seen as a potential challenge, uh, consulting on a foreign case would be considered a real plum and not necessarily something that they would uh, condone Rutledge being a part of. Um, so uh, there are, yes, is it technically possible for us to devise a way to have Rutledge wind up in a foreign country? I'm sure there is. Uh, fortunately, there's a lot of really wonderful places in England. That's why we love the country so much. There are all these different places where we still haven't said anything yet, so. We're carrying off half of England, you realize in the three years. <laughs> uh, okay, well, Joyce uh, Joyce asks, uh, what's in the future for Bess Crawford? Ah, uh, Bess Crawford goes to a wedding in Ireland and finds herself caught up in the troubles. <clears throat> so it's a departure for her, but very interesting to deal with. Um, an Irish hostage comes out in July and um, tell them what the troubles are. Interesting girl. to write. I mean, we enjoyed getting the Irish side as well as the the British side of what life was like after the nineteen sixteen Easter Rising and what effects it had on the people there and what effects it had on any English woman or English man um, visiting at that time. It's, it's what what year is that one? Um, that's June of 1919. The okay. over the peace treaty has been signed, and she promised um, the Irish nurse whose life she saved in, when Britannic went down in, in A Duty to the Dead that she would come to her wedding and, and watch her walk down the aisle. They didn't think she would ever walk again. And she said, you know, at some point I will come to your wedding and watch you walk down the aisle. So. Eileen holds her um, uh, to this promise. And she goes with- I'm hearing listen. some ghostly soundtrack music, are you? <laughs> uh, no, she's sitting near her grandfather clock that is chiming. Oh. oh. <laughs> I wonder, we were all looking nervously at our phones. <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the, this is, I thought about sitting in front of that, which is very pretty. <clears throat> but um, this is at least far enough away that we aren't deafened by them. I love the chimes. 
Maybe you can uh, ask Reese Bowen if you can borrow her Molly Murphy character, have them converge. I think the time the timing would be right. Yeah, that's exactly true. Except Molly chose to go to America and uh, not stay in Ireland. So that's right. Um, let's see if we have any other questions. Um, well, I have a question of just about um, you know about your collaborative process. I know you you, you get asked this. I'm sure every every session. Are there some books that are more Caroline, and some books that are more Charles? Uh, the no. nice thing is, we learned very early on uh, when we were learning how to collaborate before we could even finish um, a test of wills. We learned that. Everything he knows, I have to know, and everything I know, he has to know, so that we can always be on the same page. He doesn't have a character that he sees with blue eyes, and I have him with gray eyes. So we have to be very careful about this. And then <clears throat> when we start to write a, a scene, and we work scene by scene, the two of us talk it over, we go back and forth with dialogue or or what's going to happen in that chapter, how it takes the book forward, what it does with Rutledge or with Beth. And <clears throat> just go back and forth until we're happy with what we've got. And then we take the bits and pieces of Charles's ideas and the bits and pieces of my ideas, put them together and we have a scene. Then we just move on to the next scene. I think, uh, <laughs> To specifically answer your question, <laughs> sometimes, uh, well, we were in the National World War I Museum, and I came around the corner and saw something that caught my eye and immediately went and got Caroline to say, hey, do you see what I see? Uh, this is what I'm thinking. And so could you say, well, Charles had the idea first, uh, <laughs> but where did it go from there? Or when we were in Northern Wales and, and talking about some of the things that we wanted to do, uh, Caroline was really interested in these narrow boats and how not only the boats themselves, but the community that surrounded those boats with the transient population and everything, how, how that could fit in. So I guess you could say that was Caroline's, but what winds up in the manuscript is where we've both said, yeah, you know, hey, that's a great idea. Let's take it and run with it and see where it goes. Sometimes we take it and run with it and it hits a brick wall and we realize that, uh, you know, we got to back up a little bit. The main thing that we wanted to do when we first started out was to have one voice. If I wrote a book by myself, it would have a single voice. Or if Charles wrote one, it would have a single voice. We did not want this series, um, these books about Rutledge, to have two voices. So we worked very hard to make sure there's just one. And when we're happy enough that we have done that, then we move on to the next scene. But that's that's the most important thing as far as we're concerned. We don't we're trying want to, to tell distracted. a story. <laughs> we don't want our, the reader distracted by, oh, wait a minute, this sounds more like Charles. Okay, this is a <laughs> Charles chapter or, or vice versa. We want, to draw our readers in, to get them involved in the story and be entertained. That's what we're here for. Yeah. We, it's something we love doing because we love coming up with the story, but what we love even more and the reason why the 16th means so much to us for a fatal lie is we get to hear back from the readers finally and, and discover did they get it? <laughs> you know, <laughs> did it make sense? Was what we were originally trying to communicate, did it get through? Did it make the, the point that we intended? And, and not to have it, oh, well, this was 
my baby and I, you know, no. I, I do have to mention one thing that somebody asked me at a convention if Charles wrote all the battle scenes and I had to tell them, no, I'm perfectly capable of writing the battle scenes too. I've been in the trenches, I've been in a tank, I've been in an aircraft. I can write them as well as Charles can. I've looked at all the tactical maps. So um, uh, it isn't his or hers. And that the was, a, thing that was, was a smart question to ask a Southern woman. <laughs> Good point. Patrick, is there anything else? Um, not, not really. Uh, the one thing we were, when we were talking last time, and then I'll, I'll shut up uh, about the Peter Jackson documentary, that wonderful Peter Jackson oh, documentary. Yes. And, um, you know, one of the things that I, I didn't realize that, of course, you all did, uh, was that, you know, all, this whole generation of British uh, soldiers coming back from the war, uh, most of them, or a lot of them, faced very uncertain job prospects. Yes. You know, when they when they came back, there was no work and um, is that making its way more and more into the background of your of your work? It, it did, and Bess, for example, when she was dealing with the um, in a, a a forgotten place where she was dealing with soldiers who had had limbs amputated and had no hope of going back to the mines or working um, in the jobs that they had had before. That was in southern <laughs> Wales, and these I mean, this were is the tragedy. Much. Yeah, the, these men who lost an arm or a leg couldn't go back down into the mine and uh, chip coal anymore. And uh, <laughs> at the same time, the last thing they wanted to do was to be a burden on their family. Uh, and we really worked a lot with that in uh, a forgotten place. It crops up. Uh, I think just about in every book, there's at least one or more characters that has been received some level of, of permanent injury. Well, the best series is interesting and in then, you know, she actually, we saw her serving in wartime and now she's transitioning from actual battle back into Rutledge with um, the exception, I think of it's either one or two prequels, so to speak. We've met him when the war was over. Um, so, you know, it's the, their dynamic is, is different. Speaking of Bess, um, we did a really nice uh, conversation with Charles and Caroline in December about a novella about Beth, which oh. for those of you who are missing Beth allowed you to have some Beth, Bess um, before we get to July. And it's a prequel. It's a, well, if not a prequel, it's a look at Bess as a child um, and her family. So can you remind us, because I'm sorry, I'm blanking out on the title. It takes us hey, to- Hanging England. at Dawn. Hanging, hanging at Dawn. Hanging, hanging was involved in it, right. A hanging yeah. at Dawn. And for those of you who read Bess Crawford, but might have missed the novella, it's a paperback and it's a wonderful story. And it will help you learn about Bess's parents and about Simon. Um, I really liked it very much. And so with any luck, I'm sure we'll talk to Carolyn and Charles again in July when we Absolutely. get um, best at the wedding. But I want to thank all of you for joining us today. Let me remind you that we have autographed copies of A Fatal Lie, 23rd Rutledge on its way to us. Um, so we're really excited about that. And finally, let me wish everybody and you too a happy Valentine's Day. And even you, thank Patrick, you. I left you a Valentine on your desk today. So oh, thank you. I know you won't get it tomorrow, but nonetheless, there we are. Patrick, can you hang on for a minute once we're off Facebook so we can talk over a couple of things and sure. let's say goodbye to Carolyn and Charles. Um, it's always good to see both of you. Yes, Looking it forward to the day when we can do it in person. Well, we had lunch at Virtue today. So with any luck, by the time we get to you don't want to come in July, but by the time we get to the next Rutledge, hopefully we can do it in person and once again go out to dinner. Now hey, listen to hey. this. If, if I'm sitting here at 28 degrees in an ice storm, July sounds wonderful. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to see you in July. We would, if indeed you want to come, but we probably won't be eating outdoors. <laughs> All right. Anyways, great to see you both. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.
Thanks so much for having us, Barbara. Patrick, bye-bye. Good to see you. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.